You cannot fake time on a surface. Things happen, they can happen very quickly, but that is a, that is a commitment to a lifetime of slow painting. So when the painting is coming towards its end, then sometimes I can be very fast. But this is because of the longer conversation that has percolated under the surface for many months. My name is Megan Rooney. Uh, I'm a painter, I'm an artist. Uh, I grew up in, well, sort of very mixed um, upbringing. I was born in Cape Town in South Africa, very close to the sea. So I took, I was brought back to a little house that was a whaling port origi originally. So it was, you know, 100 meters from the sea. And then my family emigrated to Rio de Janeiro. My father was um, working in the music industry, so that's why we traveled as a family. Um, some of my very, very first earliest recollections as a child were of waking up in South America and um, in Brazil, in Rio, and looking out of the window of my bedroom. It was very little, and I could see um, the Cocovada, so the Statue of Christ, because we were sort of nestled on the side of uh, a mountain in a very tropical, luscious um, garden with turtles and um, these made very strong impressions on me as a child. So later my family, uh, seven, about seven years later, my family emigrated from Rio de Janeiro to Toronto because again, my father's job um, moved us uh, to North America. So I would really say that I was brought up in Canada. Um, I went to, I studied in, at the University of Toronto in Canada. I grew up in Canada, but my family is, is very mixed. I would, I would probably say that my biggest influence as a maker came from my relationship with my mother. She herself is an artist and a maker. Um, you know, I, I owe her uh, my sort of perspective of looking, my working eyes. She, she introduced me to, um, to the universe of color, really. She is an avid gardener, so she cultivated across three continents, kind of interior um, paradise, so to speak, where, where we grew up. I was very much reared in the garden inside of nature. Uh, color played an enormous part of uh, the way I sort of felt in the world. So when my mother emigrated, when my family emigrated from South America to um, North America, we arrived in a very different palette. It was a kind of beige, brown, taupe uh, landscape. So as an act of sort of resistance, my mother painted our suburban house flamingo pink. And in North America, this was quite a radical gesture. So we became known in the neighborhood as the women that lived in the pink house. Um, and that kind of started to shape my identity of, the, of, of what color can do, how it can wound you, how it can embolden you, how it can change your sort of attitude to things. Um, and I was a very restless, uh, child. So my mother always gave me things to do with my hands because I didn't like to sit still. And because she was always making in the garden, I sort of followed her around and began to understand how to think about forms, how to think about the different levels in the garden. So she was making a kind of what I would consider a, a living artwork out of the landscape, uh, which, which meant that it was, it was very nuanced the way that she thought about color. And so this kind of very um, particular lens seeped into me and that became a kind of, and is still a very strong driving force for the way that I look at the world. My first mural, although I wouldn't at the time have thought of it as a mural, was on the back of this pink house in the veranda area, which is where we would have our meals in the summer. Um, and 
on many occasions, my mother came up with these great ideas for me when I was struggling um, in high school or you know needed something to do. Uh, so she suggested that we go to the it's a kind of place where you would find used materials, uh, cheap used materials. So I picked loads of different colors, and she suggested I make a kind of fresco painting on the wall. Um, and because she was always in the garden. It was, you know, it was terrifically fun. So she was gardening and I was making this painting. Um, and then later on, fast forward, I moved to London um, and I have always lived in kind of squat-like studios in London because of the economics of the city. It's very difficult to stay central if and have a big space. So I was living in one studio, kicked out of another studio, and I was invited to do an exhibition, but I had nowhere to work in the lead up to the exhibition. And that's when I remembered this part of what I was doing and suggested, oh, maybe I could start painting on walls again in situ. Um, so it came out of necessity, really. And, and then I, and then I, fell very much in love with this. Painting on the wall is something entirely different. It has a very long history. It's something that humans have always done, have always had this desire to leave a mark, to make a trace, to say, you know, I was here. And this impulse, I think, is very much instinctual in me. Um, and so when I go towards making a mural, this idea that it's not going to be there forever gives me a lot of power, a lot of freedom that I don't have in the same way when I'm working on canvas. As a maker, as a painter, I don't work when I'm making my murals or my paintings on canvas with any kind of preparatory sketch. This is my body's response to the space. Everything that happens on the surface is a conversation between the canvas and myself, or the wall and myself, the architecture and myself. There is no roadmap, so to speak, no, no guiding kind of direction. I don't know how it will look in the end, and neither do the people commissioning it or working on the project with me. So you both have to kind of accept that there is a, by nature then a, a lot of risk. Uh, it, it's very likely that things won't go to plan and I think that's a really good and important part of the process. It exists because of that risk, because of that time situation that forces a sort of decisiveness that you otherwise don't have in the studio. Of course you have deadlines in the studio, but they're not the same. Here you are taking on a scale that is infinitely larger than yourself. So you're painting something that you are actively creating a horizon line in of your own doing. But there is a kind of madness to this because as it grows in scale, it overtakes you. And you start to then feel how your body and what you have made has made a response to, to something on a very large scale. This is tremendously exciting. Um, you know, for me, it becomes a, a kind of question more of endurance, how long I can launch my attack or my position. Um, if, if it's, you know, it's a bad analogy, but it, it's a little bit like trying to get a, a, an airplane off the runway. If you sort of walk a jumbo jet down the runway, it will never fly. You will never get this off. So I have to sort of, yeah, launch myself with as much momentum as possible and then try to keep this momentum for as long as possible in order to, for the painting to fix a position. Um, you know, and I realize I speak about the paintings as if they have a kind of life of their own. Um, and I suppose, and I suppose I, 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 I do sort of think they do. And in a way, at some point in the painting's life, I always begin to recede. It's as if, is as I sort of disappear in the end, and it is the thing that lives. And this is, this is very psychologically 
you know, perplexing to me. I still haven't figured out why exactly or how it happens, but it, it, with every painting it does. You know, the surface at some point has to have in it something that you wanted, but you are not aware at the beginning what that thing is that you are looking for. So you have to be able to anticipate the thing that you also weren't expecting. Um, you know, to do that is a skill as much as, as much as it is to make the mark, is to understand what it is you do that you hadn't thought, you know? You cannot imagine how much the painting changes during the course of its life. People who come to the studio and see the work in its development, in its beginning to its end, they can't find that painting that they saw before. Um, so if you set out to really go on a kind of journey with your work, you can't know where you will end up when you start. And you won't learn anything if you tried to get to the end at the beginning. It has to fail, it has to, it has to you know, stew, it has to brew, it has to fight. You fight it, it fights you. You know, it's a constant kind of push and pull. It's very, you know, I'm a very um, aggressive painter a lot. Uh, I hover, I, I go in, I, I use colors to chase each other. Um, it's important to challenge, to challenge the, the surface constantly. Um, and when you take it a little bit further, it's very often, this is when you lose the painting. It's, it's moments away from completion can be its destruction. Um, but if you don't risk that little extra, then it typically usually stays in a register where I would reject it. So it, it, it needs the necessity of that thing that almost kills it to make it complete. And that is, you know, baffling. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't, I don't have a better word for it. It's, it is baffling. And at the end, I have always a very strange feeling that I don't know who made the work. And that's very bizarre. Um, they really do live on their own afterwards. And then I sort of think, oh, okay, <laughs> who did that? It's, um, this is when it belongs to you. This is when it belongs to the public. If you don't have that moment where you get out, then it, I think it stays in, in a certain register. This is not to say it's better or worse, but I think you, the viewer, have to find some way to come in it doesn't mean it can be anything, it's the opposite. It can only be like this when I'm finished. I, I'm ruthless at the end. If I can move or add anything on any inch of any painting, colossal wall painting, Kunstsaal Dusseldorf, tiny, tiny little drawing, then, I, then it's not finished. So for me, the closing of the painting comes when I can't I can't move it an inch, and I will do this over every inch of every work. And then it is finished, and then I am, and then it's not, it's not me anymore. It's, it's a good part of the process, though. This prepares you for lots of things in life, because we lose things all the time. I started off as an etcher, so I very much like to think about images in the reverse, in the negative, because of course when you're working with copper etching and intaglio, you are creating a negative and then you're printing it and then you get the reverse. So when I was working at the Palais de Tokyo in, in Paris a few years ago on this colossal mural, um, I ran into some problems because I started in completely the wrong scale. So I was making gestures that were about this big, which meant I would have probably been there for 200 years to get across this incredible round curvature. And so very quickly I had to open my pace. And this is when I decided, or I, I started to think about the, the forklift as an appendage of my body, as a way to fuse myself mentally to the machine so that my spatial understanding suddenly got a lot bigger because the machine elevated me and it allowed me to move, you know, horizontally, forward, back, three-dimensionally in the space. And when I started to think of this as an extension of my arm, as my painting arm, 
it, it was a revelation for me. And in this same mural, because I had started in very much the wrong scale, at Palais de Tokyo, they have colossal sander, wall sanders, because they make, you know, incredible temporary walls. And the curators there and the technicians there said, well, why don't, why don't you just start sanding the parts that you don't feel are working? Great, great idea, perfect. And as I was sanding, I started to remember my practice as a, as a printmaker. And then I started to understand that I could also work in paint in the reverse by removing the paint with power sanders. And so it was actually um, a, a incredible shift in my practice because it meant that when I returned to the studio, I started to create this logic on canvas so that it would retain the same feeling as my wall paintings do. So I, I paint also with a sander. I take away and I add, I deposit, I subtract, um, and I use the sander to grind the paint away. And this became a, a very interesting way to think about how I could also find form and color through removal. You cannot fake time on a surface. Things happen, they can happen very quickly, but that is, a, that is a commitment to a lifetime of slow painting. So when the painting is coming towards its end, then sometimes I can be very fast, but this is because of the longer conversation that has percolated under the surface for many months. This group of paintings, this family of paintings is, is um, well, the exhibition title is called Flyer and the Seed. So I have really been thinking about this idea of casting out and planting and letting things grow and climb through the, through the painting, through the surface. So you can see there is a tempo, there is a pace in many of the paintings. There is a lot of, it's very lyrical, these, these paintings. Um, and people have been asking me if, if some of the, the lines in them are correlating to um, scores. Um, and I, I would say yes and no. I've also been thinking about, I've been thinking a lot about Paul Klee um, and his writings about line, which I found in his notebooks very fascinating. And I was thinking about, you know, can a line be, can a, can a line be itself? Does it animate? Does it, I've, I've used line in this exhibition to create abstract, in my mind, physical architectural spaces that I am climbing up through the painting. This was a great revelation for me to reintroduce line. It's bringing me back to my, old days as a printmaker, etching, um, and I've found it as a useful kind of mediation inside the internal ecosystem of that particular painting. You have this leaning out for yellow, very primitive line that's going across the surface, jutting out or bringing you to a different uh, landing point in one part of the painting. Um, and they are for me very musical. You can find a, a beat or a, a response. And this is my body's response to the painting. This particular family of paintings were started in the early, well, the late autumn. So when things are, I'm, I paint in a way that's very connected to the time of year, the temperature of the light, the, the feeling of different, atmospheric conditions. So the body of work began in late autumn. So we had this kind of feeling of decomposition and things falling from the trees, leaves, this kind of the way that the earth smells at that time of the year, it starts to kind of ripen and rot and decompose and colors can sometimes get very fascinating as they fall in city landscapes, you know, trees dropping their leaves. Um, and I'm constantly observing these minute details. Then in the, we went into winter and this kind of brings a coldness to the air. Winter air is also very clear, very sharp, almost 
uh, accusatory sometimes. Uh, and we have a lot of blustery, atmospheric weather in London. And this is where my studio is. So I'm perched in a kind of position uh, on the third floor of an old building that where you, you get the storm kind of coming in. So there are paintings in this family group, this tribe of characters that feel very wintry. Um, and then of course, we have spring and spring's arrival. So I can also imagine different temperatures. Some paintings in this show are very hot. They are from imagined scenes, leaning out for yellow. The painting is, that is behind you is a very hot, warm end of summer painting. Uh, the painting that's behind me, Eyes on Arcadia, is a spring, spring's um, eroticism, spring's sensuality, spring's, you know, spring for me is the most sacred of all the seasons. I feel a, incredibly charged as a painter during the spring. You have a very unique situation where nature has its own time frame for the way that it starts to bring color back into the landscape. And as a, as a painter, and of course I'm not the first to have this relationship, many, many people uh, here have commented on the same things, um, but it's very specific. And the, the freshness of the green, the penetrating quality of a magnolia pod, suddenly you look up and pink, dusty pink perfection is just, you know, hanging off a tree. Then in mimosa, the shock of yellow. And, you know, I have a tree in London that I go to visit for the last six or seven years in the spring, a colossal mimosa tree. Um, it's on my running route. And when it, it, you know, there isn't anything more beautiful than this tree in bloom. So I use all of this information from the world to percolate into the, into the work. It is my first exhibition with small paintings. Um, I think after the Louis Vuitton, with, I had an enormously challenging uh, Frank Gehry's room in Gallery 8 had no straight walls, and it meant that every time the walls changed size, they changed shape, size, direction, pace. Um, and after painting in this space for eight weeks, almost a year to this period of time last year, uh, I started to think, Maybe I can condense the field also to come down. Um, and that was something I hadn't tried before, so it's been a new discovery. Uh, because in my mind, I, I, big is very, is, is simpler for me as a painter to go large. And to come down, I always struggle to find a way to kind of close that little universe and make it intimate. And then, you know, as we spoke about earlier, it's a process of trial and error. And for some reason, I think the experience of uh, battling in that mural for so long and finding it so challenging physically, mentally, spatially, you know, at one point when you're down at the bottom of the wall, you don't even understand that as you rise in the forklift, the belly of that wall is sticking out so much and so pronounced that the machine is rubbing up against the, um, the side of the canvas. So with these little paintings, I imagine myself in colossal buildings instead climbing up the surface. Um, you know, but yeah, I'm as surprised as anybody else that it was possible because in the last 10 years, I've tried many times and I've thrown away all of them. It never worked. Um, and, and now it's, it's something new. Um, which, is, which is exciting for me. The titles how, are important to me in the painting process because this is the way the work is named. So you know, leaning out for yellow, it gives you some feeling of what happened during that conversation between the canvas and me and me and the canvas, the intimacy of that dialogue. Um, my wind for your mirror, or upstairs the matriarch in the family. It's a very stormy, uh, dark maroon painting with yellow um, flashes coming through it. And that painting was made mostly at night. So I called that painting Wild Wind Roaming Night. 
Um, and the, the nocturnal paintings are new for me. Uh, usually I prefer to work in natural light and daylight. So this palette that we were speaking about earlier, the stars and numerals, I think is the painting that you're speaking about, which has a very strong, saturated, fierce, ferocious night um, scene came from spending some time in uh, the west coast of Finland, um, where my partner Benjamin is from, and looking at the landscape there. So painting from memory is also crucial to the, to the way that the paintings have a kind of life as well. The expansion of the palette for me has been a way to unlock different tempos in the, in the pieces, different times of the day. They evoke different times of day, you know, dusk, nightfall, first light, the, the, the vulnerability of the, the way the canvas feels right in the morning, you know, when you wake up and you start painting before anything has filtered in the news, before coffee, before anything. I am, I am more vulnerable with the work. At night when I paint, I'm more wild, more ferocious. Um, you, I also draw different tempos and paces based on the light conditions. When light pours into my southern facing uh, studio and the sun starts to dance across the work, you can follow this actually happening in the studio in real time. And a lot of the painting is made as a response to this very um, incredible atmospheric conditions. And every painting is a microcosm of another painting. So within that world, you can go into one small section of the painting and come out and find yourself in an echo of that work in a different part of the gallery. Then you go down into the basement and those paintings have been specifically thought of to hang in a, a slightly darker environment. Upstairs in the, on the first floor, the paintings have uh, more artificial lighting. Um, this was considered as well, and the palette here is designed for this space in a way. Um, yeah, that's always something we think about when we're building an exhibition.